Hi there. Good conference? Cool. I'll try not to spoil it. Um, thank you for being here. I know it's late. It's been a long day, long conference. I will try and keep you entertained. Hi, I'm Chris. Um, my lifestyle is not as glamorous as Diana just made it sound. Um, I guess um, I spend my life being pretty tired at the moment, but um, it's cool to be here, so thank you. I'm a user experience person, and I might often start a talk with something like this. It's a bit harsh, maybe. It's kind of funny. Um, but actually, I'm here today to really present a manifesto of pragmatism rather than idealism, which is not to say that I'm not an idealist, but I want us to think about being pragmatic. So, for example, this interface is fine under certain circumstances. I have no problem with this interface if the users, the people who are using it, are subject matter experts, and they know what everything means. That's fine. That's great. No problems. I have no problem with it if the information in the UI is grouped in such a way that makes sense to the users. That's fine, too. I have no problem if it works for real users in a real scenario, like they can actually use this, it's effective, it's efficient. Great. And I have no problem if this is better than the thing that they were using before, if this helps them get what they need better. So pragmatism, very, very big on pragmatism. So Russ Olson gave an awesome opening to this conference, to the moon. Thank you, Timo, for the photo, by the way. Um, it's a great talk. It's an aspirational talk. It's like, yeah, yeah, we should go to the moon, man. It's cool, right? It's amazing. It's so weird, actually, to be on the stage and see the photo of him on the stage, and now someone's taking a photo of me on the stage. Yeah. I guess that's what we mean when we talk about iteration. Um, yeah, this is a, it's such a great talk, right? Like, it's so motivating and powerful. And then you sort of look at, like, what aspiration looks like in a design context. Um, and it, things get more complicated. And honestly, if Russ, had, like, if I'd known when I was going to give this, uh, this talk and it was going to be the closing session of the conference, and I'd known that Russ was going to open with To the Moon, then this would be a really short talk, because I would just make a five-minute presentation that was basically, how do we get to the moon? One step at a time, duh, right? That's, that's how we do it. Um, and I think sometimes in design, we don't think about that kind of iterative approach. People are having grand ideas, right? People are like, I'm a creative. Wait, I'm creating. I'm, you know, sometimes people think about design as this kind of, this perfect process where you go away and you're quiet and you think and then you present this thing and say, there it is, it's finished, it's beautiful, take it, build it. And that's awesome, but that's not design. That's really, really not design. Um, I have a very different view of what design should be. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be aspirational, but I'm saying it's hard to start anything if we're aspirational. And stakeholders don't care if you write beautiful code. This is my colleague, Lena, on stage in India last week. She's right. Stakeholders do not care if your code is beautiful. So they don't care about that level of aspiration. If you're a designer, nobody cares as much as you do about your beautiful UI, right? It's yours. It's your baby. You made it. It's amazing. Everyone's like, well, yeah, whatever. Does it work? How am I going to build it? Really? Really? You want that in JavaScript? Really? And so it, the aspirational thing, we should always like, be thinking about the aspirational thing. But actually, pragmatically, it's like, well, how do we get there? And I think that what we should do is we should approach design as scientists and engineers. 
I nearly became an engineer, actually. It was, it was this close. Um, I went to university to study engineering, and then after five weeks, I was like, meh, I like the science, I like the computing, engineering, meh. But it didn't, you know, it didn't work for me, but I became a scientist, and I think how we approach design is a lot about science. And I'm not talking about making beautiful things, I'm talking about making functional things, effective things, things that work for real people. And my idea of design is just this, and I don't think this is that dissimilar to what you all do all day. Build, test, iterate, right? That's, that's my job. And in fact, I'm not paid to have an opinion. To me, an opinion is, it's okay to have an opinion, but you need more than that. I, need, I get paid to validate design choices, to actually show designs to real people and test them and see whether they're good, whether they're the right thing. And I love this quote. The network now so obviously and explicitly extends beyond the bounds of any individual being able to say anything useful or conclusive on or about it in isolation, that telling someone your opinion is like telling them about your dreams, right? You know, that's nice, but so what? And if we just rein that in a little bit, telling someone your design opinion is like telling them about your dreams. Great, have a dream, but validate the dream. It's really important. You can't just have that dream and be uncritical about it and go, here's my dream there, build it. Doesn't work like that. I'm all about quotes today, it would seem. In God we trust, all others must bring data. It's so important to bring that data. This is what data looks like, by the way. This is awesome, right? I could watch this all day. This, to me, is an indication that something needs to change, right? So good. The only way to know if your design is going to trip people up is to test it. No one looking at that tent design probably thought, oh, that's a tripping hazard, you know? So put it in front of people, test it, look for data. Another way of thinking about this, another quote, is no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Very old quote, very famous. Slight adjustment, no design survives contact with the user. You can have it in your head, it can be amazing in your head, put it in front of someone, two minutes later you're like, why? Yeah? It's really, really hard um, to put a design in front of a user and not find out that it is in some way fundamentally broken. The more you know about that user or those users, the better the design will probably be, but if it's the first draft, nah. I'm sorry, I don't know the source to attribute this to. This came to me on the internet. This is user-centered design. We all talk a lot about user-centered design. The idea that we ask people what they need, and they tell us, and we observe what they do, and we listen to what they say, and we build a thing. This is user-centered design. So this is what happens when, instead of observing and listening, we kind of go, if I were a user, hang on, I can only smell the user. Yes, they want, they want validation messages. Probably not. So when we sit and we think about what users might want, we're kidding ourselves a little bit. We don't really know. And the thing is that users are the number one experts about whether your design works or not. So we should find them, and we should ask them. A side note, our brains are really terrible things. They're really, they're like they're amazing. They can come up with programming and maths and art and all kinds of amazing things. But if you put them in front of a UI, they are really stupid. They're really stupid often. They, they miss things, you know, they just, you know, for some reason we're really bad at perceiving information in a kind of UI form on a screen. 
this quote from Ross Olson's talk stuck with me. He said that ancient machine couldn't really do both things at the same time, so it crashed. And I thought, oh, brains are like that. If you get a brain to do two different things, it will crash often. It can't do two things. It doesn't parallel process. It does extremely fast serial processing, but not parallel processing. And sometimes, nah, sometimes it just falls right over. It is true, users do entirely misunderstand propositions. They miss huge calls to action. They ignore clear basic microcopy. This is because brains are not very good, I'm sorry. So we have to work really hard to accommodate how brains actually work. We have to be tolerant of users' behavior, because really what it's telling us is, this is how the brain works. This is how people perceive information. So I want to share with you today some examples of when good design intentions were just not enough, and when I learned. Um, I know it's not the same, like learning from someone else's mistakes is never as good as learning from your own, but hopefully you can enjoy you know, my mistakes and maybe laugh at them, maybe learn from them. And by the way, good design intentions are never enough on their own. So I want to show you these in the spirit of, um, you know, we all make mistakes, but we pick ourselves up, we carry on. So I'm sorry that I don't have real screenshots of this. Um, I, was, I worked at Skype for a little while, and um, I didn't have the presence of mind to actually take screenshots of the situation, but this is my reinterpretation of what happened. So for a while, people use Skype still, right? Or does everyone use like Google Hangouts now? Once upon a time, we all use Skype, right? OK, good, some people at least. Um, so, you know, you have your various options, kind of your menu up there, and you have like your contacts library here, right? And if you click on one contact, it kind of brings up some information about that person, maybe a photo, maybe some other stuff. And this was at a time when we wanted to test the idea of having tags, so you could tag people like friends, family, colleagues, work, whatever. And so we asked people to add some tags. So they clicked on the call to action. That seemed to work. Brought up a modal. OK, going to add some tags. Great, ready to add those tags. Where the tags go? Like, the tags are right there, but because this was a new user interface, like they hadn't added tags before, they didn't know. Nobody really knew where the tags had gone. It was so strange. They're right there. And this reminded me of something, and it's a thing called change blindness, which you might have come across before. And I want to show you an example of change blindness, because it is cool. And it's one of the ways in which the brain is not very good. So here's a nice picture. It's a little old, I think. So it's a nice couple having a date. The picture is going to flicker, and something is going to change. And when you see the thing change, when you work out what it is, I want you to put up your hand. So here we go, a little flicker. What is changing? Can you, if you can see it, can you put up your hand? Maybe it's easier. Everyone at the back is putting up their hand. This is really interesting. Maybe it's harder if you're at the front. OK, right. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Um, for those who still can't see it, that railing is moving up and down. Yeah? Now, it took ages to notice that, right? Like, some of you got it pretty quick. Some of you, it took a long time. That, that's no reflection on you as a person. Um, but what's interesting about this is the way that it can be really difficult to spot. I'm going to stop that because it's kind of too much. And what, what's happening in change blindness, right, is that essentially when any, when any time there is like a discontinuity, like a blink of some kind, your perceptual system kind of loses a lot of the fine detail. It keeps the, the big picture, you know, the sense of what is happening. Your, you know, your mind is hanging on to the, the narrative, the story. But it loses these little fine details. And so any discontinuity like that, like a wipe, can lose little things. And you just retain the whole. And if, you, if you're, the scene is not familiar, then you might retain less. And so I thought, wait a minute, this is what's happening with this, this modal. And this happens actually in real life a lot. Like, you drive in the rain, you have the wipers. And it's actually really dangerous to be driving in the rain with the wipers because you can lose small details. Like, you know that you're driving, you know that there are two other cars, but 
you might not see a change in speed of an, another car. You might not see if someone steps out into the road. So change blindness is, you know, it's very interesting, but it also has lots of really practical applications. But this is not a road safety lecture, so I want to go back to, uh, to this. So what's happening here, right, is that the person clicks on the modal, we dismiss the modal, and the scene is kind of roughly the same as they left it, but they've lost that fine detail because of that white, because of that modal to not modal situation. So what you want, really, is something to, to show. When you've, when you've wiped the screen in this way, you want to kind of indicate, hey, something has happened. And using animation or something like that as a way to call attention to the thing that has happened can really work very well. So I guess that was the thing that I learned very early in my UI career was like you've got to call attention to things when you wipe the screen because that's really important. Um, otherwise, people may not, you know, they may miss those details. I've done quite a bit of work um, in the last couple of years on the gov.uk site. Uh, I don't know if people know about this. This is the UK government website, and um, it had a lot of money and a lot of attention to try and improve it. You can see that it's not beautiful, but it's as functional as they know how to make it. And in particular, I worked on the service for visas and immigration, so for people who want to come to the UK to work or to study or on holiday. And we had to deal with a lot of legal jargon, a lot of kind of, you know, policy, basically. Um, and one of the first things that I learned was that if you show people a whole bunch of text, they don't care. The longer you make the text, the faster they scroll. Now, this was a little artificial because we were not asking people to make a real application for the visa form. Um, but still, as soon as we showed them like a big body of text, they were like, nah, nah, yeah, yeah, whatever, and they would scroll which made me think of this. And actually, I feel like we've kind of trained people to scroll through long bodies of text. Does anyone actually read all of this? No hands. <laughs> I, you know, increasingly, we're just like, whatever. Honestly, if I had to design a UI for the end user license agreement, I would probably just do this because no one reads it, no one cares. You know, if they click the button, it's because they're saying, OK, you got me, you own me, you own everything. It's all yours. I just want to use this software. So a lesson, a really important lesson was if you want people to read it, you've got to make it short. People do not want to read a lot of text. And then we come to the form itself. This is a very early draft. You can see it's not really styled. Um, what we found was that we put everything in sort of, you know, one long form, like everything about you, where you're coming from, and like, you know, who you were. And people missed a lot of the fields. Like, we would get a lot of pogoing on the page where people would throw errors because they'd missed one field and it would bring them back again. And um, I can't, again, I didn't take a screenshot at the time. I'm better at taking screenshots now, but um, at the time it didn't occur to me to take one. But I found a similar thing. You know, any long web form, right, will do exactly this. If you miss out multiple fields, then it kind of usually gives you this, this laundry list at the top of, uh, oh, here's all the things you didn't do. And then if you actually want to go to the fields, you've got to kind of scroll down and go through all the fields. And the user experience of missing multiple fields or dealing with multiple errors on a page is pretty horrible, actually. And so I think it's really important that we let people gracefully recover from mistakes. Um, and you can do that in a couple of ways. You can make your error process nice. You can make it timely. You can make it highly visible. And you can make short web form pages. One of the things that um, I've seen is that people who are filling in web forms where each page is very short, they don't mind clicking next, 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 continue, continue, because to them it feels like the experience is fast because they're traveling through all these pages really fast. If you give someone a long web form and they kind of the page loads and they just look at it and you can just see them go, oh. right? So sometimes the subjective experience of having to fill in a form can be altered just by that. 
It's actually, it reminds me of another story about a Houston airport, I think, somewhere in, in um, Texas, where people got very tired of, uh, they would get off the plane and then they would wait for their baggage and the baggage took half an hour and uh, everybody was tired and bored. And they couldn't fix the problem, really, of getting the baggage off the plane any faster, but what they could do was they could make people walk a much more long route to get to the baggage carousel. And so by the time you got to the baggage carousel, your luggage was coming. And people stopped complaining about it. So subjective time can be really important. Like sometimes it's not about objective time. Sometimes it's just what, what do you feel is happening? You know, how do you feel time is passing? And so we go back to this form, this long, you know, these long pages with lots of mistakes. And one of the reasons I think we were getting errors from this, one of the reasons people were missing out fields and then they would have to go back and fill them in, was that if you look at this, this is not empty fields. This is not a form waiting to be filled in. There is stuff there already. And this really ties into this idea that Caroline Jarrett um, promotes, which is that forms are a conversation. So when you look at where people actually fixate, this is from eye tracking data. So if you look where people fixate in a form, it's often the fields. They want to jump from empty field to empty field to empty field. They want to get through it as fast as they can. Maybe they don't even want to read the labels. If they can kind of get a rough idea from you know, looking around the field, they just want to put the first thing in that they can. And I've seen this happen for real. So this is a, uh, another client that I worked for recently, where um, I saw someone basically look at this page, and they, I, I knew where they were looking because their mouse, their cursor actually went where they were looking. They moved the cursor, and they went, OK, field of study, yep. Academic status, yep, OK, get started. Those are not full fields, right? Those are actually labels for the fields that you're supposed to complete. So they clicked straight on the button through an error because she was required to actually fill in this information. So if you put text into these fields, then you're breaking up that conversational flow. You want to have a conversation, you've got to kind of very clearly say, OK, here's my turn nationality, here's your turn, type in the box, and, so, and like that. So you've got to take turns. And it's only polite, right? Like it's nice when you're having a conversation to let the other person speak. And that's what Caroline Jarrett is talking about, to say, be nice, be polite, take your turn, wait for the answer, ask the next question. Now we had a lot of fun with this form when it came to one tiny thing asking people their name. Simplest thing in the world, right? No. <laughs> so there are some countries in the world where people only have, like their name is only one thing. They don't have, you know, like a first name and a family name. Um, and we wanted to allow those people to use the form. Normally what would happen is if you have different fields for first name and family name, then if you only have one name, then there would be an instruction somewhere to say, oh, please put like a star in the box if you only have, you know, in the empty box. But these forms are like legal documents. And when you get to the end, there's this thing that says, if you have put anything incorrect, you know, you, you'll be in a lot of trouble. We may refuse your application, blah, blah, blah. And the person typing this is going to go, well, my name isn't star. Why, why should I put that? That's not my name. And so, we wanted, we, because of the back end system, we weren't allowed to have a single box for name which would have solved everything. But we couldn't do it because there was some back end system that we were integrating with that demanded two fields. And the options were, you know, put a star in or let's do something else. And so we said, okay, let's do something else. We don't want to make these people put a star in. That's, that's rubbish. So, okay, so what about I only have one name? And then if they click on that, they'll be able to tell us what the name is. And so we put this in front of users in the hope that they would give us some feedback on this, bearing in mind that the likelihood of finding a user who actually was in this situation, right, like who only had one, one name, uh, one, one piece of their name was tiny. And uh, this is pretty much what happened. So what they actually said to us was, well, I, I do only have one name. I've never been married. I, I do only have one name, I don't have a middle name, so I just have my first name and my family name. 
So we thought, okay, we'll, we'll change it. I only have a single name. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> right? So people were like, well, I, I do only have a single name. I, I've never been married. <laughs> so this is hard. And uh, we went around about four times. This was like the first thing in the forum, and we went around like four times to try and get this right. Uh, and in the end, we ended up with this, which was a good fix for two reasons. So first of all, we said, I'm not sure how to enter my name. Right, and that expanded, and you can see some of the text here. And that was great because if you were sure how to enter your name, you didn't have to think any more about it, right? You could just skip right over that. But for people who weren't sure, the likelihood of them only having a single name, so one, you know, my name is one word, was pretty small. So we dealt with the more common cases first, like maybe you have a junior after your name or the third or something like that. And then if you still if that still doesn't apply to you, then OK, you can say, I don't have a given in family name. My name is one word, right? This minority case hidden away in there. And that seemed to work pretty well. Um, and that was a really kind of humbling experience, actually, to spend this many rounds of testing with users finding out how to um, ask this basic question. But it taught us a really great design pattern, which is I'm not sure about x, where x is just you know, the, the thing that you're asking people to fill in. It's a really nice design pattern that can easily be skipped over by people who don't need to see it. But for people who are not sure what to do with your form and their eyes are looking around the page, what to do next, they can find that and go, great, that, that's for me. But you're not necessarily being specific about what their problem is. You're just saying, OK, you have some kind of problem. And then we get to the section on criminal convictions, right? Because when someone applies for a visa, you have to ask them about their criminal convictions. And how this went down was basically people would read the question and go, do I have any? Nope. <laughs> Straight to the no button. I'm not a criminal. Nope. And that was unfortunate because, um, sorry, uh, actually, it included speeding tickets, right? Lots of people have speeding tickets or kind of minor traffic offenses, you know, for driving. But people just didn't see that at all. They just went, nope, not a criminal. Next. And one of the reasons I think this is happening is because of how people read. Like, this is eye tracking data from people reading a website, and this is people who read in English, so left to right. Um, and you can see that they read in this kind of F shaped pattern, where they're mostly scanning the left hand side, and their reading behavior kind of trails off as they go that way. And so, when we're putting something like speeding tickets, which lots of people might have in that area, it makes them less likely to actually see it. It's kind of hidden. And so we ended up with this, which was much stronger, which is, OK, what do you have? You're going to tell us about one thing at a time. And you might have a criminal conviction. We don't think so, but we're going to put that at the top. And then you might have a driving offense. So it's right there, so people can hopefully you know, read it. It's right on the left-hand side. And that tested much better. So I include this really just to say that the wrong words and in the wrong places. So you know, asking questions like, are you a criminal? <laughs> of course not. You know, um, hiding the really important and the really majority case over on the right can sometimes just get completely lost. And we had to learn that the hard way. This is another fun one. So it, there was a question on the work visa about, are you applying for a visa in a shortage occupation? Now, a shortage occupation is this really specific idea um, that there are defined areas that the government selectively wants people to come in on work visas for, because there are not enough people in the UK doing that job. But when we put this in front of people, everybody went, well, yeah, I'm applying for a work visa. Of course it's a shortage occupation, otherwise I wouldn't be applying. Right? Because people's understanding of what a shortage occupation was wasn't this technical, legal, precise thing. It was like, well, if I'm applying for a work visa, I guess you need people like me. But no. So this helped us understand users' mental models, right? Like, users have a kind of, everybody has a kind of uh, set of mental models about how the world works. You know, a kind of a structure, like, um, how the world is, but in sort of simple, basic terms. And these users' mental models were totally reasonable, that if you're applying for a work visa, it's because we need more people doing that kind of job. 
And it also reminds me of another time at Skype where um, we did testing of the product with people who were in their maybe 50s and 60s, and they weren't very familiar with computers or phones, but they understood this basic principle that Skype is like a telephone for your computer. Very straightforward, right? So we got them to go to Skype.com, and we got them to download the app onto the desktop. Um, and then we said, OK, what are you going to do now? And a few of them said, well, now I'm going to use my phone. And I said, OK, how's that going to work? And they were like, well, it's on my phone now, right? Because I downloaded it on the desktop computer. And it's not their fault. You know, no one was stupid. It's just that's their mental model. They don't have a very tight mental model of how Skype works. They just know it's like, um, you know, a phone but on your computer. So that's, that's illuminating. That really helps. You know, that helps you think about how you design the service. It helps you think about the words that you use to talk about the service. It's amazing. So inferring mental models from users' behavior is just oh, so much fun. Here's another one from Visa World. Proving you have enough money. Now, the policy intent here, the intent of the, the people who um, allow you to come into the country, is that you, you must arrive with some money. You must have some means so that you don't come to the UK and then you have nothing while you wait to start your work, you know, that you're going to get paid for, your, your visa work. But people didn't really get that. Um, people thought that initially that this actually meant that this was how you were going to pay for your visa. Completely fair, right? That's the mental model. We're asking you about money because we want to know if you can pay for your visa. Now, we're asking you about money because we want to know that you'll be OK coming to the UK for the first little while. And so the demands were, you've got to have £945 continuously for the last 90 days in a bank account. And you have to send us documents showing this, so that the last 90 days. And you have to make sure the most recent document is less than 31 days old. So hang on, I've got to show the last 90 days, but the most recent document can be up to 31 days old. But 31 days old when? Is it 31 days now? Or when I submit the application? Or wait, but if I submit the application tomorrow, then I don't have the statements for the last 90 days. It's the last 89 days. <sighs> and this is really hard, right? And the, the beauty of this is that by trying to write simple explanations of what was required, it showed everybody everybody in, in that part of government, how weird these instructions are. The simpler you try and make the UI, the more it shows you the ridiculousness underneath. You know, If you're designing a really simple, clear UI, it basically exposes like the business logic to proper scrutiny. It basically says, look, here's what you're asking. Are you, are you sure you want to ask that? These two things seem kind of different to me. And that's a really nice way to get internal stakeholders to look at what they're actually asking users to do when it's right there, 90 days, 31 days old. They admitted, OK, yeah, that's, that's tough. That's, that's difficult for people to think about. I like it when people say, OK, yeah, maybe that's not so good. It means I'm doing my job well. I just like to make trouble, basically. So I talk about this stuff with people a lot, and they say, well, that's great, Chris, but I have no UX resource. I have no money. I don't have a UX person. I don't have a user researcher. I don't have any of this stuff. How can I do this? This seems like it would be expensive. Um, and to, to which I say, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can do with whatever you have right now, I promise. So the first thing that you need to do is get out of your own head. And I don't mean drink lots of beer. I mean. You, you can't be in your own head when you're asking these questions, right? when you're spending time with users, uh, when you're looking at your designs. You have to see someone else's perspective, because you are not the user. Sometimes it really helps to get out of the building. You know too much. Your team knows too much. You need to take a step back. You need to go and find people who don't understand this like you understand it. You need to talk to at least one person who is either an actual user or a proxy user, which is to say someone who is demographically similar or someone who wants to be able to do similar things, someone who is a little bit like the people that you're trying to reach. And it will reward you. This quote encapsulates for me 
uh, Luke Jones saying, I've never left a research session thinking I have learned nothing today. Every time you sit down with someone, you will learn at least one thing. Sometimes you learn 10 things. It's always worth doing. And it doesn't have to cost a lot. You can spend half an hour with someone. You can buy them a coffee, give them some biscuits. Just listen to them. Some people just want to be listened to. Honestly, it costs nothing to spend a little bit of time with someone who doesn't know your product like you know your product. And then do it again, if you can. Doesn't have to cost a lot of time or effort. If you can, get it on video. So there's software out there that will help you do all this to record people while they're interacting with the UI. And that's great, because you can play it back to people later. And you can review it yourself. And you can get all the things that you weren't able to note down because you were too busy asking questions. Um, and by the way, we don't blindfold our users. That's, that's not what we do. This person can actually see. I just wanted a little bit of anonymity here. And this is what you want, right? When you're videoing, this is what you want to be able to show, is this kind of thing. Like, you know, four out of six users fell down coming out of the tent. That's, that's data. That's meaningful. And then when you have that, you want to share it. They don't look very happy, right? They're watching users in pain. And that, that pleases me, right? This is when I know I'm doing my job, is when a room full of people are watching video that I've showed them, and everyone's going, <sighs> that's, that's what I do. That, honestly, that is the kind of the pinnacle of, of what I do for a living, is getting people to feel the pain that the users felt. Because now we can have a conversation about what we need to fix, right? This is the moment when everyone's feeling a bit vulnerable and like they want to do something, because it's not nice to watch people being confused, especially if you thought your product was great and the design was amazing. And this is why you should be doing that. Because to get feedback and to decide to do something about it early in the project is so cheap. It can just cost a few hours of your time, very, very little. If you leave it until the end, it's going to cost a lot. There's going to be rework to do, which you know costs money, the cost of delay, right? Um, extra development time that you don't need. Or if you decide not, like if you leave all the, the research and if you leave all the testing of your designs until the end of the project, then people might say, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll just go live anyway. It'll have to do. And that's a huge risk to put something out there that isn't the right thing for the people who are using it. So you play the videos, you show them to people as senior stakeholders you can manage, and you watch them squirm, and then you say, right, let's fix it. And they go, OK, yeah, we, we should probably fix that. And if they still don't, then you go out and you get more data, and you do it again the following week. And what this does is it reduces project risk. So this is when we were going to go live with our visas for uh, applicants from China. And we had a lot of work to do and not very much time to do it because we'd given a really hard deadline. And we made it. We got it out on time. And we did it in part because we did regular user research. We showed the pain to the, the development team and to the stakeholders. And we watched them feel that pain. And then they said, OK, you're right, this needs to change. And we did a lot of that very early on. If we'd left it until the end, until they wanted to do their user acceptance testing, I hate that phrase. Um, it's too late at the end for user acceptance testing. Users have to accept that the product's going to go live in user acceptance testing. That's, that's not good. So really, what I'm saying is you want to make people uncomfortable until your users have stopped being uncomfortable. Share the pain. There's this slightly overused quote from Steve Jobs. It says, stay hungry, stay foolish. I'd like to change that. I'd like to say, stay humble. Prepare to feel foolish, because you will, a lot. But it's worth it. You've got to park your ego. This is not about you. It's not about your beautiful design. It's not about your beautiful code. It's about what do users need. That is all you should be interested in. So we're not talking about some creative vision. It's good to have that in mind. But day to day, that can't be what it's about. 
It has to be about putting it in front of real users, getting real feedback. It has to be about engaging with the product owner and making sure that they understand the feedback, making sure that they can see what's going wrong and making sure that what they want and what the business wants is aligned with what users need. And you've got to look for this. Wherever you find this, if it's important, if it's something that actually matters, you've got to share that with people. Video is great for this. In the way that you're enjoying watching this, stakeholders love watching short clips of video where stuff goes wrong. Well, I love watching stakeholders watching the video. They hate it. They feel pain, but that's good. They should feel pain. So then do this. And if something really matters, if you go and you put your product in front of people, and you put your designs in front of people, something genuinely matters, you'll see it. If it's really a problem, you'll see it. If it's not a problem, don't worry about it. Like, you can go in there with a really strong opinion about, oh, this will never work. And sometimes it works great. And you have to swallow your words. So be humble and just go, OK, right. I have a secret idea that this design is not great. But if I don't say anything, then if it tests OK, I don't look like an idiot. And if it doesn't test well, if there are clearly problems, then you come back and you look like you just discovered Antarctica or something, because you can come back and go, look, I got all this video. This doesn't work at all. Who knew? Even if you knew. You know, keep it in here. But genuinely, if a design works for users, don't worry about it. It's OK. Whether it was your design or someone else's design, doesn't matter. Don't have an opinion. I mean, you can, but there's no point, right? Test it. See what happens. So I guess to wrap up, really, like you can't always get what you want if what you want is that creative vision and that handing over of something magical, like the Sistine Chapel or something, right? You know, where kind of God is giving a spark of life. You know, it's not going to be that. It's never going to be that. But if you listen to what users actually need, then you will get what you need, which is a product that works, which is designs that do what they need to do. And that is how we get to the moon, one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I actually have one question. Let me just reload this. Yeah, it stays at one question. OK. OK, how would you balance design versus its counterpart security? Oh, what a great question. Um, this comes up for me a lot, that kind of that conflict between usability and security, right? Like, you want something particularly for important things, like, say, the visa application. You want something that's going to be secure. People are going to use a secure password. Um, but you need them to be able to remember it and log in. This is like one of the, the discussions for our ages. Um, so I guess both sides have to give a little bit. So I'll tell you an example from the visa situation where um, basically the the part of government that deals with visas said, we have all of these rules about what kind of password someone must set. You know, it must be at least eight characters long. It must contain at least one special character. It must contain at least one number, something, something, something else. Uh, it cannot contain, you know, any common words or whatever. And um, we tried making a UI where we explained this. And I showed it to someone whose specialism is writing clear copy for the web. And she said, I can't understand this. No one will understand this. Um, and it was true. It was really hard to understand. And it was especially hard to understand where you had met some of the criteria, but not all. So you only had, you know, you had three of the four things that you needed for a secure password. Um, it was very difficult to, to help people recover from that. And uh, so we went back and we said, no one will apply for a visa. No one will create an account if you make it this hard. And the security people said, well, OK. And they made it a little bit easier. We still needed a slightly more complex password. Like, you couldn't enter you know, password. Um, it had to be more complicated than that. But they had to give, or no one was going to use the system. So uh, this sounds like a cheap answer, I guess. But like, um, uh, everyone has to compromise a little bit. Um, and, but that question will never get old. 
because people always want to be really, businesses always want to be really secure. Users always want to be able to use the service, so. Good. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you Again, very much. for the talk. Thank you. Thank you.